everyone in the locker room, including the coaching staff, knows how we all feel about one another and how much confidence we have in one another. And um, my words, my display of emotion, which I, I do my best to control up here, is that it, I've got conviction over it. And, um, you know, this is not the same old Jets. But until we win, until we prove it, which is on us as coaches and on us as players, the, the shots will keep on coming. And so we welcome them, keep bringing them. It's not going to change our mission, and that's to bring this organization and this fan base a winner. All right, uh, we know who that is. It is Robert Sala, the head coach of the New York Jets. And Connor Rogers, I had to play that off the top. I know you are a Jets fan, a Jets, a Jets observer. You're what? You're a Jets investor. That, that's who you are. So <laughs> it's bad uh, money, Michael. If, it's bad money. That's but one day, one day it's going to happen uh, for the Jets. How, how do you feel about what what Robert Sala is doing and what he's saying? about the Jets. Do you believe in the do you believe in the vision? Do you believe in the direction that Joe Douglas and Robert Sala will take the Jets or try are trying to take the Jets? Yeah, I think he's in such a tough spot, right? Because he walks into that job and takes over a franchise that hasn't seen the playoffs in over a decade. And he's probably looking at it. Let's be honest. It's his first head coaching job in the NFL. He's looking at it and going, man, I've only been here for one season and I'm being judged on the 10 before me. And I think it's a little bit of both, right? I think it's unfair to Robert Sala. I think he deserves, like most coaches, that two to three year sample size to get your players in and show that your scheme works and your coaching works. But on the flip side, Jets fans, the Jets organization, they obviously had lived this much, much longer. And he's a smart guy. He has the awareness of that. So I think Joe Douglas has done a lot of good things. He's also had his hiccups. I think Robert Sala deserves a longer leash there. And he got, he got really frustrated after criticism from week one that felt like criticism over a 10 year span. And I think it all bottled up and came out and he's aware of that. And he knows until they win games, nobody will treat them differently. Okay, how about what he said? I'm keeping receipts. Okay. One, why? <laughs> uh, two, two, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with them? He said, you know, I can't wait. He said, I can't wait to like bring them out. I, I, I remember the names and, and who said what? All right, what are we doing? I, okay, we could do, like we should be doing that. We should do that, that's yeah. fun. You're a Jets fan. If, if I come at you and say, man, the Jets will never, they'll never win. They haven't won since Super Bowl three and they win Super Bowl 60, then you should come to me and be like, hey, see, uh-huh, got you now. But why is he doing it? Why is he saying it? Right, it feels like something that should be saved for the fans, should be saved for the media, and even if players want to do that, right? I mean, there's plenty of players. Listen, you know me, Michael. I work in the draft business. There's plenty of guys that get evaluated yeah. the wrong way, turn to stars, and they thrive off of that, and good for them. I think it's awesome. Now, a head coach in the NFL, I don't think they have time for that, and that's why this felt like an emotional moment to me. But listen, I've been in New York. Yeah, I grew up in New York my entire life, and every single coach or you know GM or whoever I've seen try to poke the bear and win a battle with the media, it never works. It never works yeah. because they'll just keep coming at you over and over again no matter how well you perform, they will sit in the bushes and wait for that one low moment to attack you. So I think he walked away from those comments or stepped off of those comments real quickly in the middle of this week because he realized that. And you know what? They don't realize, Connor, that there's so much. Like, that's all we have to do. It's like, they're, they're coaching football. So they're, they're, they're obsessed with, with, with stud, film study and just trying to dissect opponents. That's all we're doing. To, we're not studying uh, like they are. We're talking about them. We have so much material. We're parsing every single word, every single flinch, body language. We're studying. So we just have more time to think about what they said and to take it to absurd levels. You can't win it. You can't win against the media. <laughs> it's just too many angles. They got, they got more than you can block. All right. I mean, it's not, the, it's not the extra guy. It's like two or three extras. Yeah, they have hindsight. You're exactly right. It's so easy to sit there because the media gets to react to Monday morning and be like, well, 
you did this and it didn't work, so you should have done this. While the coaches are the ones that have to make the decisions in the moment, and some guys get praised, but most of the time, the decisions that don't work out are the ones that are discussed the most. And that's what makes that job so difficult. But obviously, when they take those jobs, Michael, they know the deal. All right, Connor, let's talk. Uh, I know you're not one to overreact. Uh, I'm not either. Maybe not. Last year, Green Bay Packers started 0 and 1. They looked terrible. Lots of bad things were said about Aaron Rodgers. He lost his focus. The Packers are out. The Packers uh, were, uh, won the division again, right back to the playoffs. This year, Packers start 0 and 1. And Aaron Rodgers throws for fewer than 200 yards. Some similar conversations about the receiving core. Overreaction to be concerned about the Packers? I think so, and I really don't say that often after week one about anybody. Now, I will you know, put a caveat on this, that I think Green Bay is a really, really good team. I think in an NFC that does not stack up against the depth of the AFC, Green Bay is one of the best teams in that conference because of Aaron Rodgers. But, Michael, this just highlighted the things that now I have significant concerns about because I don't know if a fix is on the way, notably in that wide receiver group. But we'll start with the offensive line, right? They were out Elton Jenkins, and he was back at practice this week. That'll be huge for them. David Bakhtiari, how long are we going to have to wait for him to be right again is a big question. Is that really a fix that's on the way that we can rely on? And even if all of those things do get right with the offensive line, which would be huge for Green Bay, they got young wide receivers that I just don't know if they're ready yet. We saw Christian Watson mm. drop a would-be deep touchdown. I like Romeo Dobbs a lot, but he fell to day three for a reason. He's not going to come in and be a superstar. He could be a really, really nice player. And you see right here, just miscommunication, drops, the pressure because the beat up offensive line was really, really rough. That put even more pressure for the defense to be out on the field against a good offensive team in Minnesota that had no answer for Justin Jefferson schematically or from a talent standpoint. So Green Bay, I think they're a good team, but are they a Super Bowl team like they think they are going into the season? You have to be a little nervous right now. I started off the show today uh, talking about the, the rivalry between the Chargers and Chiefs. I understand the Chargers have won some games and Justin Herbert looks great. They still haven't gone to the playoffs with Herbert there and those dynamic two years for Herbert. Uh, but the Chiefs, I, you know, it, it's funny how you know, Buffalo has leapfrogged the, the, the Chiefs in the conversation. So they can't beat them on the field in the playoffs. The last two times they played in the playoffs, one game not close. Last year's game, you know, a classic, but still Kansas City two wins yet. They get passed by Buffalo. I think this is crazy. What? Wh why? Why don't people really understand what the Chiefs can bring as long as they have the structure they have right now with Andy Reid and, and Patrick Mahomes? I'm with you all the way on this one. People just have to be bored, right? When I saw it over the summer, I, I didn't understand how we got to the Bills being, sure, so you want to make them one of the Super Bowl favorites, that's fine. They're an incredible roster. They have a great quarterback. They have continuity everywhere. They were sitting around plus 500, where the Chiefs, you could find them at plus 1,000, plus 900, not even in the same Woo. stratosphere for Come a Super Bowl. Come on now. Bowl. It, it, that doesn't make that sense action. to me. Yeah, that doesn't make sense to me, Michael. And then, you look at what they did in the draft. They had an incredible draft. They got help on defense. They got help on offense. They have continuity on the offensive line. They have Patrick Mahomes, who's just on another planet at all times, in my opinion. And people got bored of him, too, it felt like. They played their starters in the preseason, and then what happened? They came out week one, and they were full throttle, pedal to the metal. There was no, hey, we need more time. Hey, this is an extension of the preseason. They're like, no, we're playing our November football the first week of September, and they bulldozed Arizona, bulldozed them. A playoff team last year, Arizona. Not a team that was picking top five in the draft, a playoff team. So Kansas City, I, I, it seems insane to say this, but they are somehow the most severely underrated team in the NFL, and they got disrespected this summer, and it looked like they took all of that out on week one. We, we saw uh, Sky Moore, the rookie there. What, what, do you think of, what do you think of him, and what do you think of some of the other rookies? I know only one week, but this is what you do, and I know you just, you're kind of watching guys, say, how's my guy here doing? How's my guy here doing? What do you think of Sky Moore? 
Yeah, he just brings an element to the offense that they obviously needed after they traded Tyree Kill. Sky Moore has enough juice to win down the field. He tracks the ball well. You could throw him the ball underneath and he can make guys miss. Uh, he's got really good acceleration off the line of scrimmage. And that's going to open things up for Travis Kelsey in the middle of the field or the intermediate level of the field. Same with Juju. They throw to their running backs. They like to roll out Mahomes. You could ask Sky Moore to try to win at all three levels of the field. So listen, nobody's going to replace Tyree Kill. But the versatility and how much this offense expanded now, looking many different ways instead of usually two directions, Tyreek or Kelsey, kind of makes it just as difficult for defensive coordinators where they don't know how the Chiefs are going to attack them each week. And at the end of the day, when you got to defend Patrick Mahomes, it doesn't matter who's out there, but the Chiefs have a really, really good offense around him. All right. We've seen some young players just come into this league and start wrecking immediately. Uh, on both sides of the ball, I mean, Micah Parsons, oh, yeah, it was not, a, not a surprise. He was great in college, but the way Dan Quinn used him with the Cowboys was perfect. Really spoke to his skill set. Uh, who are a couple of guys in college football you're watching now? A couple of games into the season, you say, oh, wait till they get to the league. This thing is just, it's not only is it going to continue, it's going to go up a notch. Man, I mean, there's some obvious ones at the top, right? Everybody's watching Will Anderson, the edge rusher on Alabama. Everybody's watching Jalen Carter, the defensive lineman on Georgia. Those guys are destined for the top five. So if you're looking at how the NFL draft's going to go without the variable of the quarterbacks in play, Bryce Young on Alabama, C.J. Stroud on Ohio State, they're going to be top 10 picks with a couple other guys trying to find their way in. Those two defensive studs are just total difference makers. And then if you're looking for one that I think doesn't get enough love, I look at the middle of Baylor's defensive line and Siaki Ika. He's a nose tackle. He's over 300 pounds. I mean, he really is kind of this Vita Vea clone who's been a lights out player mm. for the Bucs, has won a Super Bowl there. Uh, Siaki Ika is somebody that doesn't get as much attention because he plays for Baylor, who's been a really good program over the last two years, but he's an absolute stud. So I look at next year's draft and see superstar talent on the defensive front. Deep at quarterback, I think we have five go in the first round. There's plenty of wide receivers once again. So I think actually next year's draft, the 2023 class, has a lot more juice, a lot more excitement than 2022 because all the stars in it play vital positions. All right, I saved this one for last uh, just because I know how much this means to you. I'm here with you, brother. I am here uh, for support. If you just need somebody to talk to, I got you. I'm going to get you through the month of September into early October. The lead is down to a half game. The New York Mets are leading the Braves by a half game, and it just got swept by the Cubs. So, hey, man, uh, what's going on? What's going on with the Mets? Like, it, it, give, give me, uh, give me some insight here. We are at DefCon One right now. Listen, it, it's uh, it's brutal right now. It's brutal to watch. You know what? It's one thing if they were going out against contenders, right? They took two or three from the Dodgers. Everybody's riding high. But when you drop two or three against the Nationals, you get swept at home by the Cubs, where we don't even know who their starting pitchers are half the time or more than half the time. Uh, I'm not in a good place right now, Michael. I knew we were going to get here. I, this is usually how yeah. we go out. The September yeah. woes are hitting. I, I need this team to turn it around. I need Max Scherzer to return, and I need them to win the division. I can't deal with the stress of the wild card or throwing DeGrom no, no. and Scherzer in the wild card and then being in the divisional round with the back end of the right. rotation against whoever. Uh, this is this is not good right now. Not good at all. It was a lot more fun, Connor, when uh, the Yankees saw their lead just kind of shrinking, shrinking, and the Mets were just kind of holding serve. They're yeah. up by four games, five games. That was fun. And see the Yankees at one point, the Yankees up by like 12, 14. Then it was down to 10. Then it down to seven. I think it sits six right now. It it's did. Like, oh, yeah. See, we, yeah. we wanted to see the Yankees have a nice little collapse, but I'm not enjoying this with the Mets. I didn't, I ride for the Mets. So I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you in spirit. Know that. I think they're going to win a division. It might be close, but they're going to they're gonna pull this thing out. Well, I appreciate that, the uh, the support here. And I think it's going to come down to that second to last series of the season when they have to go down to Atlanta. And, you know, they've played big in those moments before. They're going to line up Scherzer and DeGrom and Bassett, their big three down there. So it'll probably come right down to that second to last series. It's going to be a sweat. But I'm with you. I do think they pull it out. I'm, I'm trying to remain optimistic. It's all I can do right now. Hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time.
on Peacock. Appreciate you.